Beginning in the late 1950s, Larry Snyder started a home-based fiberglass business, which grew during the next 30 plus years into a builder of a multitude of industry-leading plastic products. It all began with a summer job building boats out of fiberglass in a small town in Nebraska. I needed a summer job for 50, 1957 and uh, so I went down there and applied at the fiberglass boat company down there in Waverly. Uh, it wasn't shortly after that then that uh, he wanted me to repair the boats so I took over the boat repair uh, out in my garage and alleyway of the corn crib and uh, the hog shed and the hay mow in the barn. This boat repairing business was the beginning of Snyder Fiberglass. The income helped fund his college education. For Larry, a college education at Nebraska Wesleyan University was his grounding for business. Probably the most influence anybody had on me was Dr. Metcalf at uh, Nebraska Wesleyan University. He was absolutely a great guy, uh, uh, understood the real business of business. If you understand accounting, you, you understand what you have to do in business. During college, Larry was dating Cheryl, a University of Nebraska Lincoln student. I say I have a vicarious degree in business administration from Westland, simply because he was so enthused about what he was studying that that was largely our dates. Throughout college, Larry kept doing fiberglass jobs, including one that turned out to be a lot of fun for a legendary racing enthusiast and businessman. Bill Smith, of course, which is the leader in the industry for hot rod parts and hot rods and things like that. I'm walking down the street one day. And I got a, I got an old body. And of course, it was Bill Smith, you know, and everybody likes to imitate Bill. That's my imitation. So anyway, I took that old body and uh, put a lot of body putty in it, a lot of fiberglass, a lot of masonite, and uh, got it put together. Took a mold off of it, and we built... I don't know, hundreds of parts out of that. Larry continued to build these parts on the farm while a student at Nebraska Wesleyan. When I was in college, they told me how to finance General Motors, but they never told me how to go to the local bank and borrow $500. The part-time business during college required some innovative financing. I hawked my, my saxophone and bought a roll of matte and cloth with that. In 1961, Larry graduated from Wesleyan married his sweetheart and business partner, Cheryl, and enrolled in graduate school at Arizona State. Larry took graduate-level finance and marketing classes at Arizona State in anticipation of a future career with a Fortune 500 company. He had an opportunity to interview with a major corporation, Borg Warner, in Chicago, and thought he could see a path to Easy Street. Well, probably after an hour, you know, he said, he said, Larry, he said, you wouldn't last in this job. He said, he said, this isn't the job for you. He said, you need to go back home. You need to get in business for yourself. And so we moved out of the chicken house down there and uh, moved into half of a Venetian blind building up here on 48th Street. From early on, Larry was always looking for opportunities. As a true entrepreneur, he didn't have a long-range strategic plan. Product development was an ongoing process. I didn't have any great ideas about what direction we were going. And, and it's always been my uh, philosophy to take advantage of opportunities, regardless of, uh, of what they are. And I've taken advantage and lost of a lot of opportunities. But uh, the ones that have succeeded have uh, served us very well. You know, how do you develop new products? And I said, we used to drive down the road and say, well, let's build this. And you got to try to determine, is there a market for this product? Can we improve that product? And maybe, how do we improve it? To make it more aesthetic? Or we prove it to take cost out of it? You know, in other words, how can we redesign the product uh, to fit our style of manufacturing, too? Tub showers were one of our major product lines along with the tanks. The most successful products for Snyder fiberglass were tanks for agricultural use. This fellow came to my office one day, Bob Caldwell, 
He owned Caldwell Manufacturing out at Kearney, and uh, he wanted to know if I could build him a tank, a, a, a fiberglass tank. So I said, well, yes, I can. So I, I built the tooling uh, uh, of which we patented. We patented the design criteria on the tank itself. The fiberglass ag tank product was selling well when disaster struck in 1966. We got a call one morning at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and this fella called and he said, Larry, the plant's on fire, the firemen are here, but they don't think they're going to be able to save it. So we drove over there, of course, and uh, there was nothing left. Snyder Fiberglass temporarily used a night shift at another fiberglass shop and then moved into a building adjacent to the one that burned. There was very little interruption in production. During the late 1960s, Snyder Fiberglass produced its own advertising materials. Later, Bozell and Jacobs and Swanson Russell agencies were utilized. In the early 1970s, developments in the plastic industry were superseding fiberglass for some applications. We got into financial difficulty and, and uh, uh, we were looking for a buyout or a merger or anything, you know, to get out of the situation because we owed it close to a million dollars. George Martin had been playing bridge at a friend's house when he saw a Snyder tub and shower combination. He liked it. The friend mentioned that Snyder's needed a cash infusion. He says, I'm going to give you the money to do what you need to get done. Now, he says, I'll own all the company. But he says, when you buy it back, you only buy half of it back and we'll give you the other half. What do you need? You know, and I said, well, Here's what we need. We need to get into the rotational molding polyethylene business. Larry and George went to a builder of rotational molding machines in Akron, and George convinced Larry to buy a bigger machine than he ever thought he would need. We set that machine up and we run that thing uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We use the best quality material available. The process involves loading plastic powder into a mold, then cycling the mold into an oven. The mold is rotated in the oven while the plastic melts onto the interior surface. At the completion of the heating cycle, the mold is moved to a cooling chamber and then to an unloading station. The rotational molding technology allowed for the development of more ag tank designs as well as for other industrial products. The name, Snyder Fiberglass, was changed to Snyder Industries in 1974 to reflect the change in technology. Larry had heard of one big machine, but decided to build one that was, well, bigger. I thought, well, if I put rollers here, rollers here, rollers here, rollers here, then just turn it, put rollers on then the sides too, so when it turned, well, this big ring, drive the big ring with a, tra with a chain that uh, you could probably mount a mold in. So I went to uh, Akron, Neil and asked them about it, and they thought, oh, it's a pretty good idea. So anyway, that's the way they built the machine then. The facility was completed in about a year, and limited production had started when the mold mounting ring and frame of the big machine <laughs> broke in the oven. Everything come out okay, because we put it back together, reinforced it better, and did and did uh, some other things too. And I imagine it was six months though before we had it back up and running. We sold a lot of uh, 5,000, 10,000, 12,000, and 15,000 gallon tanks then. The success of rotational molding and the big machine provided the opportunity for Snyder Industries to issue additional bonds to buy out the ownership position of George Martin and Skagway in 1983. In the late 70s and early 80s, concentrated liquid ag chemicals were being developed. These were distributed in small plastic jugs. The EPA uh, was really concerned about uh, uh, these, these chemicals that uh, might be left in a jug. We thought, you know, that the best thing to do was to build like a 60-gallon bulk tank or a 110-gallon or 200-gallon bulk tank that would hold bulk chemical. Seba Geige was one of the first major chemical companies that expressed interest. So a year later, well, we got the contract in, and I don't remember how many we built that year, maybe 3,000 or something like that. Snyder Industries built many bulks of other designs for most of the major agricultural chemical companies, 
and they provided similar products to other industrial customers throughout the late 1980s. There were just a lot of things that contributed to thinking the succession plan is sell the business. A business broker, Goldsmith Agio, was hired and after a few false starts, a potential buyer was found with a venture capital firm from Canada. This firm would provide the financial backing for the purchasers. Today, the company is still an industry leader, capitalizing on the foundation that Larry and Cheryl Snyder built. It has been expanded by acquisitions and sold several more times since 1991, but the headquarters has remained in Lincoln.